You're listening to Bloodline, Episode 5, Kings of the Cockpit. I think I see the old old now, lying upon the damask bed with the rich green curtains hanging over him, and the family arms worked in gold over the bedhead, and a table by his side with a prayer book, a posse cup, the racing calendar, and a tankard of ale, though, poor old fellow, he couldn't drink it. And his poor old face, God bless it, worn down like the edge of a hatchet, and his eye half awake, half asleep, and his long grey hair tossed over the pillow, for he was too much of a man to wear a nightcap. And says he, Who's there? I, my lord. It is I. And who the devil are you? said he, for he always had a pleasant way of speaking. It is Joe, the groom, my lord. So he woke up a bit, and he said, Joe, I'm booked. Bet any odds against me, and you are sure. Every race must have an end, Joe. And he strove to drink out of the tankard, but could not lift it. My heart bleeds to think of it this moment. There were three or four nurse tenders, and volley de shams, and others such low ragabrash about the room, where he had taken leave of his relations, and would let none of them come any more near him. He turned these cattle out at once, and away the lazy vermin went. Now, Joe, says he, this is a dead beat, and there's an end. I'm past the post. So I looked astonished like, and did not know what to say. But, says I, don't give up, my lord. There's a great deal in a second win. You may be in for the cup yet. I wish I could do what for your lordship. So the old lordy once more brightened up, says he to me, Joe, could you smuggle a few cocks into the room without the knowledge of Lady Silverstick? That's his lordship's niece. Couldn't I, says I. So I slipped down and brought him up in a couple of bags by the back stairs. They were the beautifulest cocks you ever seed and I brought him into the room as dark as night. Nobody twigged me. So his lordship strove to rise in his bed. It is no go, Joe, says he, but prop me up with the pillows and parade the poultry. Well, it would warm the heart of a Christian to see the poor old lord how glad he was when he saw the cocks. Wasn't they prime? I believe you they were, for I had picked the best out for his lordship. Joe, says he, cocking is nothing without betting. Put your hand under my pillow, and you will find the twenty-five guineas that is meant for the doctor. Have you any money, Joe? I have five pence half penny, my lord, says I. Quite enough. Now, Joe, I backed the ginger pill, and a good judge of cock he was, against any in the bag, my guinea always against your half penny. So to it we went. One match he won, one match I won, one match I lost, one match he lost. And what with one bet and another, his lordship got my five pence half penny out of me. So when his last cock was crowing over mine, says he, Joe, you're done, cleared out. And he took a fit of laughing, poor old master. It was the last laugh he had in this world. His jaw began to drop, and I got frightened and called him the volley de shams. Lord love you how they stared when they saw the cocks dead and the old lord dying. They ran up to him, but he took no notice of them, but beckoned as well as he could for me. He took my coppers with his left hand and scraped them into his bed from the table. That's why shouldn't he, for they was fairly one, and shoved over the green silk purse with his five and twenty guineas in it to me. The guineas are long since gone, but the purse hangs on the wall opposite my bed head that I may see it when I wake every morning. I would not give that old purse for the best breed of cocks in Lancashire, and that's the best breed in the world. After he had given me the purse, he cast his eyes back upon the cocks, and the bird he had last barked gave one great loud crow, and the old man's head sunk on the pillow, and he died. That's the legend of the last moments of the 12th Earl of Derby, Lord Edward Smith Stanley. This scene was from an out of print book of fiction titled John Manesti, London Merchant by William McGinn, published less than a decade after Lord Derby died in 1835. If you were around the cockpits or horse tracks in the years after Derby's death, you might have heard variations of the tale when people got to talking about the prolific and legendary cockfighter. Today, we'll be exploring the lives of some of the all time great cockers of England and the world up to that point including Derby and some of his contemporaries. I'll get them ready. Previously on Bloodline, we discussed how the British began modernizing cocking just before the 18th century began, partly out of necessity, but also due to changes in the world around them. At its biggest events, coinciding with horse races, cocking shifted in this period from individual mains held between two cockfighters and attended by a large number of gamblers to multi-person subscription mains, held more frequently between groups of many cockers and attended by a growing number of gamefowl aficionados. They adopted rules, artificial spurs, and the use of scales for matching cocks by weight as well. 
These and other factors, such as improved travel, would lead to a game fowl industry in full swing by the mid-1700s, employing full-time and professional cockers at a growing number of cockpits with jobs as feeders, setters to or handlers, breeders, cockpit keepers, gaff makers, and ancillary suppliers. This episode explores the lives and careers of a few of the greatest cockers the sport has known. From the golden era of cocking professionals, we'll take account of the 12th Earl of Derby's career, as well as that of his peer and equal in the pit, Joe Gilliver. Finally, there's Joe's great-nephew, Bill Gilliver, a lifelong cocker working before and after the sport was outlawed. But prior to this golden era of cocking, there was more of gambler and hustler than of craftsman in the few that might call the cockpit a source of income. It is among this early fray that we find William Dragonwell Frampton, a man of the sod and turf who was born into one era and ushered in the next. Born in 1641, Frampton is known as the father of the turf among the track goers for being the first professional horse trainer. But he was a man of many talents, employed at Newmarket as the master of racehorses, and also kept and fought gamecocks at the Newmarket pit through the rule of Queen Anne, William III, George I, and George II. He fought mains with success and picked up fees for outside clients of the track as well, and was paid about £1,000 per year by the Crown, an amount roughly equal to $70,000 salary today, paid beyond the expenses of the operation he oversaw, which included acquiring horses as well as several other employees of the stables. A portrait of him painted by John Wooten depicts Frampton hunched in a chair wearing an unbuttoned jacket. His pants are knee-high with hose, and he wears buckle shoes. He is probably in his 50s, with wispy brown hair cut back from his cheeks and forehead. A crooked, aquiline nose distinguishes the face. His relaxed stare is fixed on the observer, and one corner of his mouth curls back into what appears to be a slight grin, or maybe a sneer. A British battlecock in full trim stands at one shoulder on a table behind him, likely a depiction of his famous game bird, Old Sourface. History tends to paint Frampton as an unscrupulous gambler, while paying respect to his obvious skills as a sportsman. The marks against him, however, appear to stem largely from the fact that there aren't many stories about Frampton. Frampton's long-standing position as the keeper of the royal racehorses and gamefowl for almost 30 years suggests he probably didn't make scandal or scams his bread and butter. During the period, he owned, bred, sold, and even jockeyed many of his own horses. He bred cocks and fought mains with success and loved falconry. The more factual of the two stories about Frampton involve a match race on his home course at Newmarket against the horse of a northern country duke. While the duke's horse was in training, one of Frampton's grooms met its jockey and negotiated a trial race so that the two might find out the race outcome in advance in order to win bets. When Frampton found out about the event, he told his jockey to ride with an extra seven pounds in the saddle and tell no one. At the trial race, the duke's horse won by one length a difference Frampton thought could easily be covered by the secret seven-pound handicap. He and his friends are said to have bet heavily into the Northerners. However, they were unaware that the Duke had also ordered his jockey to run the trial with a seven-pound handicap. With neither side being aware of the other's trickery, both assumed they'd win easily. On race day, the horses ran just as expected without the seven-pound weights, the Duke's horse winning by one length. Assuming the story is true, it contrasts with Frampton's decades-long job in court, which would suggest he relied more on his skill than cunning to earn wages. He was the first professional horseman and perhaps the first full-time cocker in England. He was a professional competing amongst amateurs. At the end of Frampton's long career, advancements in breeding would lead to the development of the thoroughbred horse, and in the cockpit at this time, cockers began to show battle crosses that were smaller than their shake bag ancestors. Frampton owned and fought famous cock I've already mentioned named Old Sourface, who was the subsequent progenitor of a bloodline of crosses bred by him and his nearest friends and family. The cross, called Smitten Wing, is a spangle-breasted red with yellow saddle feathers and white legs. The Cocker's Manual, printed in the late 1800s, says they were unquestionably the best birds at that time, a title formerly held by Charles II's Powell bloodline. A 1687 letter to his relative Thomas Chafin illustrates the value of bloodlines and breeding knowledge early in Frampton's career. Frampton had sent two daughters of old Sourface to Chafin, and he warned him, be sure you do not part with your best cocks to those that love the sport, for if you should, they will have as good as you have, and will not desire your assistance, which must not be. Whether his legacy is fair or not, Frampton's skills are rarely questioned. He was a cocker and a horseman who straddled two eras, being born of the one and paving the way for another of professional and full-time cockers such as Lord Derby and his feeder, Paul Potter, and many others who would define an industry and organize the sport and change cocking the world over. 
By the late 1700s, aristocrats such as King George IV, Lord Vere, Lord Grey, and Lord Derby, mixed with common chicken men like the father-son pairs from the Gilliver and Potter families, or the Birmingham handler Tom Hines, to form new ranks on the sod of the cockpit between 1750 and 1850. The twelfth Earl of Derby, Edward Smith Stanley, called Lord Derby, was the most prominent of the bunch. His name appears frequently in the history books and is rarely seen without declarations of his dominance in gamefowl. We have him to thank for the use of the term Derby to mean a contest open to a field of competitors. This was the result of Derby's role as a founder of the Oaks Sweepstakes, a horse race which was devised at his estate, the Oaks, the inaugural running of which he won. Derby and others then devised a similar race the following year for Colts, and Derby won its naming rights in a coin flip, giving the Derby Stakes its name. These events are among the oldest and most well-known horse races in existence, and they run each year at Epsom. As far as gamefowl goes, black-breasted reds were very popular throughout England during this time, but derbies were especially coveted. Unlike other black reds of the period, his were said to be white-legged with black striping, the same pattern appearing in the beak, and were bred by Derby for the better part of a century until his death in 1834. They were good fowl by all accounts, and Derby's long-term work and close observation of the family was likely ahead of its time for most cockers of the period. From an 1882 book, Famous Racing Men, we get this description. Under his care and superintendence, the Knowlesley breed of black-breasted reds was brought to perfection, and at Chester and Lancaster, the North Country Earl was nigh invincible. It may be truly said of him that he was the greatest cocker that ever lived. Derby's bloodline would be influential in several American game strains, notably the Claibornes, which are said to be of a Knowlesley black red over a Spanish hen. His obituary in Gentleman's Monthly noted that he possessed the reputation of having the best breed of cocks in England. The 19th century historian Ralph Neville said Derby was without question the most celebrated cocker of either ancient or modern days, and in this light never had his equal. During his life, he fought more mains and very generally successfully than any person ever known. A generation earlier, cockers had bred fowl as if each generation was a new canvas, lacking either the means or the understanding needed to develop a bloodline through many generations. Derby was also a prolific breeder and fighter, reportedly hatching and fighting two to three thousand cocks each year, keeping them on farm walks and fighting them at two years. Like other landlords of the time, he made his country walks a stipulation of the tenant's contract. Lord Derby inherited the earldom in the late 1770s, and in 1790 he footed the bill for the construction of the Preston Cockpit, a brick and timber building with a domed skylight and elegant arched windows along the upper concourse wall. Rows of spectator seats descended down to the 12-foot diameter cockpit floor. It is reported to have seated up to 700, and during races was a de facto break room for sweeps. In the latter 1800s, the building became a meeting place for reform movement speakers such as teetotalers and suffrage rights leaders. It was briefly the home of the first Mormon missionaries in England, and remained a cockpit long after Derby's death in 1834, and even in the years after the sport was outlawed in 1849. A police raid documents one such occasion. When the law descended, the Preston mayor was in the audience and tried to hide up a chimney, but he got lodged with his bottom half hanging out. As the story goes, the officers recognized the magistrate's lower end and decided to leave him there. For more private battles, Derby was known to host cockfights as after-dinner entertainment in the drawing room of his home at the Oaks, where on the lower floor, a room was modified to include a fold-away cockpit. Furniture would be cleared from the room and the hinged floorboards folded back to create bench seats for spectators and a cockpit in the center subfloor area. When not in use, everything folded back, allowing the drawing room its original function, whatever that is. The estate home would have made a fancy backdrop to a cockfight, contrasting starkly with the country gatherings nested in shrubs or the city cockpits with their crowds and noise. The room was 33 by 38 feet, an 18-foot ceiling. A cornice with medallions ornamented the upper walls to complement decorative Corinthian columns. The rooms upstairs could accommodate 50 guests, and those on the north side of the home had a distant view of London from its hillside perch among the oak trees. Derby was married twice. He had three children with his first wife, known as Lady Hamilton, who wound up leaving him for another lord. Derby would not grant her a divorce, however, and she was unable to marry the man she left him for. Socially exiled, she lived abroad for a while and eventually died in 1783. Soon after, Derby married Elizabeth Farron, a well-known actress of the period, and the two seemed to have a happy relationship until her death shortly before his own. The Oaks residence was torn down in the mid-1950s. 
The stables are the only piece of the estate still intact, and much of the land, including the ruins of Lord Derby's villa, are now a public park. None of his children appear to have taken up the sport of cocking. His eldest son, the 13th Earl of Derby, pursued another passion, albeit with cockfighter's zeal, amassing what was at the time Europe's largest zoological collection of mammals and birds from across the world kept at Knowsley Hall, the family seat. Throughout his cockfighting career, Derby worked with the top feeders of the day, particularly Paul Potter. The duties would pass to Potter's son later in Derby's life, and when the Earl died, the younger Potter inherited all of his birds, spurs, bags, and fighting equipment, including the silk bags used for transporting the fowl, which were embroidered in Lord Derby's black and white racing colors with the image of a fighting cock. One of Derby and Potter's contemporaries, Joe Gilver, was said to be the greatest authority on game fowl that ever lived. Born into a well-established family of yeoman cockers in Polesworth, England, in 1759, Joe Gilliver would become the master of gamecocks to King George III and IV. Joe made a name for himself as a ready competitor in any sport, and had a reputation of straightforward honesty, which is said to have endeared him to his noble patrons. He also was good at winning cockfights, and drew attention over his career for pulling off some impressive wins. Once, while readying a show of roosters for a main at the Royal Pit in Westminster, a well-known sportsman named Crutch Robinson made a big bet that Joe would win the event in one day, an unlikely outcome since they'd planned to fight the best of contest over several days, meaning a couple dozen or more fights depending on the wins and losses. He pulled it off though, managing to win all his fights on the opening day in decisive fashion. In 1815, he was a feeder in the most expensive main on record. The event consisted of seven fights, each with a 1,000 guinea bet plus 5,000 guinea wager on which side would win the majority of the fights. Adjusted for inflation, that's equal to about $90,000 per fight and $450,000 to the overall winner by today's dollars. The entry Gilliver was feeding won five of the seven fights in the famous main, further cementing his reputation as a professional feeder who could win at high stakes. He regularly fed shows to fight against the best cockers or feeders in the country. The same year he won the famous Lincoln cockfight, Gilliver fought mains at three of the six major horse meets. At Manchester, he fed for the cockers of Nottinghamshire and their main against Lancashire. Gilliver's cocks cruised to an easy win in the five-day contest after winning the first 14 fights on the first day. He won another main that same year at the Chester race meet, feeding for the cockers of Cheshire in a match against those from Staffordshire. At Newton that year, Gilliver fed for a man named Lee and narrowly won the main against Lord Derby with Potter feeding. Soon after, Derby and Potter got their revenge in a close win at the Preston meet. The Newton-Preston matches continued in the same way for several years, always narrowly won and sometimes not at all. At Preston in 1814, they were dead even with 23 wins each by the end of day four. Though they could afford it, these fights were never high stakes mains, typically wagering 10 guineas on each fight and 100 to the overall winner. Despite the modest stakes, this annual rivalry featured the generation's toughest cockfighters in the prime of their careers, each venerated in the cockpit as men who were as honest as they were competitive. But as they were in the cockpit, so too, it seems, was their time for this world. Potter, Gilver, and Derby, all living very long lives, finally counted out within a couple of years of one another. Gilver was 72, and he and Potter died in 1832. Derby, aged 82, died in 1834. Joe Gilliver's great-nephew, William, called Bill Gilliver, was another noted cocker in the family. Born at the tail end of his great-uncle's career in 1826, Bill grew up on his father's game farm and showed talent for the sport at a young age. When he was 80 years old, Bill recollected the story of his first cockfight fought against a parson who had spotted a rooster he liked while riding past the farm. Bill declined to sell the rooster, but offered to fight him for a five-pound wager. Gilliver's bird whipped the clergyman's handily, winning Bill the five pounds, and he turned around and sold the bird to the man for two shillings. When he was 17, Bill Gilliver fought six mains one after another at Buckingham and won them all. Another memorable victory was the main he fought on the lawn at Manly Hall, winning eight of the 15 fights with one rooster. Gilliver was so impressed that afterwards he commissioned a celebrated artist to paint a portrait of the cock. During the work, the artist took a break, leaving the rooster walking the floor in the room with the canvas. When he returned, painter found the gamecock in battle with its own depiction, leaving several pockmarks in the canvas. More than 40 years after the event, he still had the dimpled painting proudly displayed in its home. Several times through his career, Gilver's reputation for sincere honesty and his status as a man of cocking nobility brought him into conversation with peers of the realm. At Newmarket, he was able to tell Prince Edward, 
later King Edward VII, about the day Albert, Edward's father, had visited the cockpit. The story surprised Edward, who said he was shocked to learn that his father would have stepped foot in a cockpit, even once. Gilliver replied that he thought there was no reason a man should be ashamed of seeing two chickens fight, and that he hoped the Prince of Wales, Edward's title then, would come see a main. Following the ban on cockfighting, Gilliver continued raising gamefowl and eventually started competing in the country's booming poultry exhibits, winning several awards. In his early 70s, he visited France, watching one of his roosters win its fight and crow over its vanquished foe, earning Gilliver some respect from the locals in an area of the country where the French birds were expected to beat the English roosters. Afterwards, Gilliver took out an ad in an American newspaper stating he'd stake his roosters against any in the world for between 100 and 500 pounds to be fought in France. He got no takers. For years until his death, Gilliver shipped fowl all over the world, fetching two pounds for every battlecock, or about $250 in today's money. He also owned and operated the Gamecock Inn in the Gilliver hometown of Polesworth in the latter half of the 1800s. The Gamecock Inn was said to have had an upstairs loft where cockfights could be hosted, complete with hidden exits into the alley. By the time Gilliver died in 1916, at the ripe old age of 96, cocking in England had been banned for well over a half century. The advancements made by cockers like Derby, Potter, and the elder Gillivers would change the world of cockfighting forever, but mainland British cockers were largely deprived of the windfall, which would eventually see breeds and practices diffuse into the rest of the world as cockers like Bill Gilliver traveled and sold fowl to France and other countries to pursue their passion, or some form of it at least. So how did this happen? How did we go from the heyday of royal cockpits with Georgian cockers like Derby, Potter, and numerous others who thrived at a respected craft that became disparaged Barbary within a couple of decades of the old Earl or his longtime feeder's deaths? How did a nation of cockfight and racing fanatics wind up being the home of the animal rights movement? In the next episode, we'll candle the egg that hatched the modern animal rights movement to see if we can find the answers to those questions. Transcripts are now available for every episode on the website at bloodlinepodcast.com, along with additional photos, media, and info for each episode. Or join the discussion at the Bloodline Podcast Facebook group. Bloodline is created by me, Jesse Sidlaskis. Music from this episode is Lobo Loco. You get the blues. Until next time, y'all keep them crying. Thank you.